Good morning, everybody. I'm Juliette Bouvery. I'm Chief Executive of the Stroke Association, and I'm delighted to speak to you this morning about stroke services in 2020. You may recall that at the UK Stroke Forum last year, I spoke about our lived experience of stroke reports, where we heard from 11,000 stroke survivors and their carers about the multiple impacts of stroke physically, mentally, and cognitively. Well, we repeated a survey in June this year to understand the impact of coronavirus on people's stroke recoveries. We heard from 2,000 stroke survivors and their carers, and some of the findings were, to be honest, quite bleak. Seven out of 10 stroke survivors told us that they're feeling more anxious and depressed. Over half of carers said that they often feel overwhelmed and unable to cope. Pleasingly, two-thirds of stroke survivors told us that they'd actually had a positive benefit from virtual rehabilitation therapies, but a significant minority found these difficult to access, particularly those with severe communication and cognitive challenges. And four in ten stroke survivors who'd had their stroke since March told us that they felt that they weren't receiving enough rehabilitation. So I'd now like to share with you Peter's story to bring some of these findings to life. Unfortunately, the stroke mean, meant that I'd lost the use of my left arm and hand, and also I'm having to learn to walk again. It's been quite devastating, and I'm not looking forward to the long-term prospects of rehabilitation. I need physiotherapy for that, and had a great physiotherapist, but unfortunately she had to return to the front line because of the pandemic. I also go to the gym for the disabled, and uh, get further physiotherapy there and personal training. This had to close for a few weeks again for the pandemic. The consequence of my stroke have left me feeling very depressed at times. I was looking forward to my long-term project following my early retirement and I used to really enjoy cycling, gardening and playing the piano, which I can no longer do for obvious reasons. So my mental health has really taken a plummet. Fortunately, I've got the support of my fantastic partner, family, friends and local people. If I'd not had that and I needed to access mental health services, these are very constrained at the moment because of the pandemic. So that would have been quite difficult, I feel. The Stroke Recoveries at Risk report contains some important recommendations for governments and system decision makers across the UK. We launched an open letter we got over 8,000 signatures and we handed this in to Matt Hancock, Health Secretary, on World Stroke Day and did equivalent lobbying activities in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We all know that COVID-19 has had an impact on all non-COVID services, but we've also seen some amazing innovations and adaptations in stroke services. We heard at the beginning of the pandemic about the worrying drop in people presenting at stroke with stroke symptoms and also a reported rise in excess deaths in care homes and private homes. I want to say thank you to everybody who got behind our stroke is an emergency messaging and got this into the public domain. We had significant media coverage and even got a couple of mentions in the Prime Minister's briefings. And some stroke teams got really creative, including this team in Sherwood Forest, who wrote and performed a really fun Act Fast song. We saw the rapid development of guidelines across the UK to help maintain standards of stroke care during the pandemic. Some areas of the country also rapidly reconfigured their stroke units, demonstrating that the crisis could be a catalyst for wider stroke improvements. And here's Gillian Crichton talking about how they adapted their TIA clinics in NHS Tayside. I'm going to talk to you today about how the stroke team working in Nine Wells overcame some of the challenges that presented during the COVID pandemic. 
One of the changes we made to the way we worked was around the TIA clinics. Instead of asking people to come back to a, another clinic within a few days of presenting at the hospital or by, via GP referral, we actually saw people when they presented and in the front door areas on the same day so that they didn't have to come back and travel across the city at a later date. We also phoned up um, people that had presented and referred through their GPs and we assessed them over the telephone, arranging any investigations that, that was required timely um, and within the time period that we would previously have seen them uh, within our T TIA clinics, meeting our government standards of um, assessing people within four days of referral and we were meeting that 100% of the time and actually assessing people within one to two days, which was an improvement on our previous performance. We've seen the acceleration of the use of artificial intelligence and imaging software so that CT scans can be shared more quickly and securely within and between hospitals. I'd like to say thank you to SNAP, who've managed to maintain interim reporting to the many stroke teams across the country who've managed to complete the full SNAP data set, and also to the British Association of Stroke Physicians for your physician-led stroke surveys. All of these have given us useful insights into the pan pandemic's impact on usual stroke care. And now we're going to hear from Nick O'Donnell about the way that her team have rapidly adapted the way they've delivered hospital care to patients in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Working in an area with quite severe social economic deprivation, unfortunately, we have seen lots of COVID. As a team, we looked at our key services and how we could maintain them during this time. We focused on ensuring acute stroke patients were seen by the multidisciplinary team, even on days when some of our stroke wards were closed due to COVID. With all of us setting off on tour around the hospital, we are using tablet devices to communicate with relatives while visiting is restricted, including demonstrating inpatient rehab sessions. And our community rehab team are using tele-rehab where appropriate to minimise visits into patients' homes. We always give our patients our contact details on discharge. We have noticed a significant increase in patients contacting us for advice. This may be as they don't want to bother their GP at this time or due to the understandable anxiety that COVID is causing. It's been a very busy time. We hope that we have continued to provide a service to our patients. We've also seen some great innovations in rehabilitation and life after stroke. Here's Ruth McKinnon talking about the ways that her team in West Yorkshire have adapted to delivering virtual speech and language therapy. Um, since the beginning of lockdown, we have been using virtual contacts with patients with communication and swallowing difficulties. Um, we have been mainly using um, the Accurex platform, which we found really, really useful. Um, we can share our screens with patients, we can invite other professionals into the calls, and we can also invite family members living elsewhere. So we find that really works. We have also used it with um, carers in the, with the patients, and it does help if we can have somebody there to maybe support them. Where this hasn't worked, we've then provided face-to-face -face visits. It's, we've done um, a high percentage of um, virtual contacts with our patients and it's meant that we can, we've managed to deliver a service to more patients and in a more timely um, fashion. And it's just worked really well and we've had a lot of positive feedback from patients too. And the voluntary sector has innovated too. The Stroke Association designed and de delivered two brand new services. Here for You, which matches volunteers with stroke survivors to help combat isolation and offer peer support. And also Stroke Association Connect, which offers emotional and practical support and signposting to newly discharged stroke survivors in geographies where the Stroke Association does not have a local service. And the Stroke Association has boosted many of its other services, including creating dedicated stroke and coronavirus website, web pages and some great exercise videos. And there's been strong collaboration between sister stroke charities, including in Northern Ireland, where Northern Ireland Chest Heart Stroke 
and the Stroke Association have worked together to develop and deliver a new joint stroke pathway for stroke survivors. And with even more collaboration, we've seen the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, with many partner organisations, launch the communication access symbol. This will help the 14 million people in the UK who experience communication difficulties, including 350,000 people with aphasia, to receive more sensitive support and have more accessible venues and more sensitive businesses. And what's been going on in terms of ongoing UK stroke priorities? Well, let's start with the importance of prevention. There have been 23 clinical commissioning groups in England that have been part of an AF demonstrator program to improve anticoagulation rates using pharmacist-led virtual clinics to identify suitable patients. Initial findings look promising, and we look forward to seeing the full program evaluation. In England, 20 integrated stroke delivery networks have been funded and are now being established. And we've now got a draft national stroke model, which evidences the kind of innovations that need to be adopted from prevention right through to life after stroke. We're going to hear later in the conference about GERF's new national stroke report based on visits and events with all stroke teams across England. We're really pleased that SNAP is introducing new PROMS measures, including an EQ5D and a pilot of a PREMS survey next year. It's also encouraging that Scotland has now resumed thrombectomy with its new service in Tayside. But it's fair to say that this is only available for patients in the north of Scotland and across the UK, we're seeing thrombectomy services lagging behind and we really must address with urgency the barriers to enable full rollout. And I'm delighted to congratulate our new stroke clinical leads across the UK who've been appointed or were started in 2020. We welcome Professor Martin Dennis in Scotland, Dr Shaquille Ahmed in Wales, Dr Michael McCormack in Northern Ireland and Dr Deb Lowe in England. And collaboration has even extended across the UK to the Republic of Northern Ireland, thanks to BASP's new Five Nations monthly calls. I'm now going to pass over to Shaquille Ahmed, who's going to talk to us about the response to the pandemic in Wales. Now, COVID-19 has slowed down and exposed the vulnerabilities and inequalities in our system. It's had an impact of flow of patients right the way through the hospital and has produced some real challenges to access community services. But through every crisis, there are opportunities for innovation and to adapt around the challenges. We've developed a consultant-led front door model, which has produced fast assessment and treatment right at the front end of the pathway. We've also used video technologies for TIA consultation and for tele-rehabilitation. There's been huge innovation from our OT department, who have been doing virtual bake-offs and playing virtual chess with our patients at home. Although COVID-19 has exposed the vulnerabilities in our system, it has amplified the compassion of healthcare professionals. Thank you. It's been a challenging time for stroke, but it's good to see some encouraging progress. Stroke researchers and clin clinicians have been collaborating to understand the neurological effects of coronavirus and the links between COVID-19 and stroke. The VNS rehab trial in Glasgow has shown that vagus nerve stimulation paired with physical therapy is safe and could significantly improve outcomes for stroke survivors. Many congratulations to Jesse Dawson and his team for this positive result. And last month, the Stroke Alliance for Europe published its report into the economic costs of stroke and the interventions that could alleviate that burden. And the James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership continues with findings expected next year. But despite this progress, we do know that COVID-19 has had a negative impact on many studies with a number having to be paused or stopped 
And we know that the future of the medical research pipeline is in doubt because of the impact of coronavirus. But equally, it's encouraging how many researchers have managed to restart their projects. And we're now going to hear from researchers who've done that in leading the Lunar Project. We run the Lunar Research Project, helping stroke survivors with aphasia to tell personal stories. At the start of the year, we had just started recruiting to our study before everything ground to a halt. We paused, took stock, worked with our advisory group and research team and made the decision to adapt our study. In 12 weeks, we made many changes. We changed our comparator, our recruitment strategy and moved the entire project delivery online. What have we achieved? We've recruited 28 people with aphasia. We have a team of seven staff and 12 speech and language therapy students. We have delivered 68 assessment sessions, collecting 160 stories to date, and 286 therapy sessions, all online. No one has dropped out. The pandemic has made us realize people with aphasia manage technology and challenges far better than we thought and also that stories survive pandemics. Conference delegates, wow, what a year 2020 has been. I know how tired many of you are, but you should feel so proud of what you've achieved this year. On behalf of the whole stroke community, and in particular, on behalf of the stroke survivors and their families whom the Stroke Association represents, I want to say a huge thank you for your tireless efforts. We're full of admiration for the remarkable teamwork, innovation and dedication that you've shown across the UK. But it's fair to say that we can't rest on our laurels. Stroke still remains one of the biggest health challenges of our time. We owe it to stroke survivors and their families to help prevent stroke, to save lives, but also to invest in much needed rehabilitation and life after stroke so that we can rebuild more lives after stroke. Thank you.